Norman Finkelstein is one of the world's most distinguished scholars on Israel-Palestine, who has written probably the definitive account of Israel's decades-long war on Gaza. His book, Gaza, An Inquest into Its Martyrdom, was published in 2018, and it gives a forensic account of Israel's two previous bombing campaigns on the Strip, Operation Cast Lead in 2008 and Operation Protective Edge in 2014. I spoke to Norman for Navarra Live on the 4th of December to discuss events since October the 7th and Israel's latest assault on Gaza. Half of this conversation was streamed on the live show. The full version is here. It was an incredibly expansive and challenging conversation. And I began by asking Norman about his view on the last three days of Israel's assault on Gaza. So that since the end of the seven day ceasefire, which collapsed last week. My reaction was uh, a personal one. Uh, yesterday, there was an article in The Guardian, Your Guardian, about these grids that Israel had handed out uh, or posted on the web of where the people in the south of Gaza are supposed to flee. And the article, I guess it was in the comment is free uh, section of the Guardian. The article indicated the extent to which these quote unquote instructions are complete chaos. Nobody knows which way to go, where is safe, where is not safe. Most of these instructions are inaccessible to large parts of the population. And I, as I was reading through this article, immediately what came to mind for me was a statement that my late mother made uh, regarding her own experience during the war. So once she was interviewed about the subject, in my generation, there was a famous book. It's an awful book, but it nonetheless was famous by this so-called a Holocaust historian, Lucy DeWidowich. And the title of the book was called The War Against the Jews. And my mother reacted in indignation. It was not a war. It was an extermination. And she described with one metaphor how she conceived her experience. She said, we were like cockroaches. Every time the light was shined on us, we rushed in another direction. And then it was shined on us again, and we rushed in another direction, and in another direction, like cockroaches. And people may, as always, be offended by my analogies, but it reminded me that description in The Guardian reminded me of the Palestinians rushing in this direction, rushing in that direction, the bombs falling here, rushing in that direction, the bombs falling again, rushing here, scurrying there, scurrying here, scurrying there. It's not a war, it's an extermination. What do you mean by extermination? I mean, I know you've studied in depth the previous two bombardments on Gaza, so in 2008, 2009 and 2014. Now, you sort of document in, in great detail the human rights abuses, the sort of callousness when it comes to human life. But they weren't wars of extermination. I mean, do you think that this war does now meet that definition? And if so, why? You can use the Israeli terminology, which actually in all of its sinister aspects is nonetheless indicative of a deeper truth. In previous Israeli high-tech massacres on Gaza, they were referred to as mowing the lawn. And mowing the lawn uh, conjures the image of cutting the blades of grass. However, with the expectation that the blades of grass will grow back. 
the aim was to periodically reassert Israel's control, total control of Gaza and Israel's refusal to brook any resistance. However, October 7th was something of a different magnitude for several reasons. Number one, there was clearly and there remains a sheer bloodlust element to the Israeli reaction after October 7th, uh, because the scale of the, I would call it operation slash atrocities that occurred on October 7th, they were of an altogether different magnitude than had occurred in the past. I should be careful here because every statement of mine will obviously be used against me. When I say operation slash atrocities, it's not altogether clear to what extent what happened was due to orders from on high and what it, to what extent it was the result of spontaneous actions by the people from Gaza. So uh, I am waiting myself. I'm not so confident the truth will ever come out, but I am waiting myself to see the, uh, though that kind of distinction between orders from on high versus uh, initiatives taken spontaneously and personally. And there's also a second question, namely the extent to which the deaths were resultant of the actions of the individuals from Gaza and the extent to which they were the result of Israel in the course of firefights. Having said that, I want to make clear the evidence at this point is, in my opinion, conclusive that atrocities did occur on that day. I'm sorry for that long-winded excursus. However, I have to be careful that when words are plucked from me, I have qualified what I have already qualified what I said. There's an element of bloodlust in the Israeli attack after October 7th uh, on a much higher level because, you know, in the past, the pretexts for its operations were so trivial by comparison and even almost objectively. Um, Secondly, because what happened on October 7th was such a colossal humiliation to Israel in that it undermined uh, its pretenses for having this world-class, maybe first-rank intelligence services. I mean, Israel has basically built an entire reputation on its capacity for special operations like Entebbe, its intelligence operations. In other words, its reputation rests less on its military prowess on the battlefield than it does on its various uh, extra battle capacities, intelligence, special operations, and so forth. And that reputation was dealt a lethal blow by October 7th. And therefore, Israel, to restore what it's called, it's called its deterrence capacity, namely the Arab world's fear of it, had to, as it were, ramp up its destructive capacity in order to compensate 
for its intelligence failure, spectacular intelligence failure. I mean, there's very little to compare to that. Um, and um, so that's a second reason why this Israeli uh, current round is on a qualitatively different level. Uh, and the third reason is obviously because, as the cliche has it, every crisis is also an opportunity. And Israel saw this crisis as also an opportunity to, for once and for all, solve the Gaza question. And its solution has not yet been consolidated. Different people in the, in the Israeli administration have made statements uh, going in different directions. Some say to transfer the entire population to Egypt, a mass ethnic cleansing. Some say to make Gaza uninhabitable forcing the people at some point to leave because they have nothing to go back to. And some like Netanyahu analogizing, analogizing, excuse me, analogizing uh, the people of Gaza to uh, Amalek, which means an outright extermination. Uh, but uh, these are, this is obviously a different goal, however it's conceived. It's a different goal than mowing the lawn. We've been highlighting on this show, I know you've been highlighting on your Substack and in various interviews, sort of the genocidal rhetoric, which is coming out of Israeli politicians. I mean, it's pretty clear um, that's the way they are speaking. What's less clear to me is how possible it will be for them to achieve such maximalist aims. And I want to read um, a passage from Haaretz from yesterday. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Israel on Thursday and met with the Israeli War Cabinet. Defense Minister Yov Gallant and IDF Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi showed him the military plans for the continued campaign and spoke of a few more months of high-intensity combat, a significant part of which will take place in the southern Gaza Strip. Blinken replied sharply, quote, You don't have that much credit, unquote. In other words, the U.S. believes that Israel's military clock is out of sync with that of the international community. That latter clock is ticking much faster. And the reason I read that out is because obviously the US sort of putting their foot down would be one means by which Israel or the far right members of Israel's government could be restrained from achieving um, their, their maximalist aims. I mean, I, I'm not sure what you think about other um, sources of restraint on them, but what do you think Israel will be able to get away with in this war? We have to begin with the obvious, which is, could be missed, sometimes what's most obvious is most overlooked. Israel has gotten away with an awful lot already. Uh, there have been a number of analyses published comparing what Israel has done to any other conflict in the first quarter of the 20th century. And at any reckoning, at any level of analysis, what Israel has, quote unquote, achieved, uh, whether it's in the deaths of civilians, the deaths of civilians as compared to combatants, the numbers of children killed, it's in a league all its own. So as we f press forward to see whether Israel can achieve its final aim, we should not lose sight of its extraordinary achievements to date. Now, there is no question, and this is not a rhetorical flourish, there is no question whatsoever that all Biden has to do is pick up the phone and say stop, and it stops. If you will recall, Biden gave strict orders that when you enter Al-Shifa Hospital, it can't be a firefight. You better behave yourself, pretend you're human, difficult as that may be, pretend that you're human, 
you can't carry on the way you have with other hospitals. And that's exactly what Israel did. Remember, Al-Shifa was Israel's prize. It was, to use the expression from, to, to borrow from the expression or to bastardize the expression from the British era of the British Empire, that was the jewel in the crown of their assault on Gaza. And nonetheless, they were quite careful. Obviously, they committed crimes in, in Al-Shifa, but it was on a very, very low level, except for the mass expulsion of the 60,000 people inside Al-Shifa. It was a kind of, you won't know American history, but it was a kind of trail of tears of the Cherokee Indians. Uh, it was about, in the case of the Cherokee, it was about 15,000. Here it was probably on the order of 40,000 is emptying out of Al-Shifa because there were 60,000 people in Al-Shifa at the time. But nonetheless, uh, as compared to what Israel normally does, it was a much uh, tamer level. And that's because Biden gave the order. And Biden can stop the whole thing tomorrow. There's no question. It's not as if the EU, the only other place that's supporting Israel is the EU. It's not as if the EU is going to defy the United States. Like Schultz is going to say, no, Zeke Heil. We're going to kill them all. No, you know, he may harbor that wish, but he's not going to say, I'm sure Ursula van der Leyen, the Nazi princess, would be disappointed uh, if Biden called it off. But obviously he has the capacity. Now, uh, people often say, well, uh, if Israel wanted to do X and Israel wanted to do Y, why hasn't it already done it? You know, Israel has nuclear weapons. Why has it nuked Gaza? Um, if it really wanted to carry out an extermination, which is, I don't want to belittle people, but on moments of reflection, the answer is just completely obvious. Countries don't operate in a vacuum. There are things you can do and there are things you can't do. To take an example, which again may offend people, but I'll, I'll risk it. Um, the Nazi final solution could not have occurred during a peacetime. Hitler needed a war in order to carry out his plans. There's no question about that. There were very severe limits to what he could do up until 1939. If you remember, and you, again, you're excused if you don't, uh, the German reaction on the whole, on the whole, the German reaction to Kristallnacht was very negative. Uh, not necessarily because they cared about the Jews, but because it, they thought it was beneath the, civilized, the German civilization, civilized people don't go around breaking windows in synagogues. That's what ruffians do. That's what thugs do. Um, so even in terms of, if we can use the expression public opinion in Nazi Germany, they were not at that point ready for a final solution. It required the war, the hysteria, the Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy to destroy Germany. And still it had to be done behind the scenes. You know, one aspect of the final solution that remains to this day an enigma is, did Hitler give an order? We don't know exactly what was the fashion because you couldn't do these things in the open. So there are always limits on uh, 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 that curb a state's uh, uh, the, the uh, implementation of a state's goal. The goal is clear. It's one way or another to wipe out the Gaza problem. One way or another, you may say, and I wouldn't disagree, that certain ways of wiping it out are less humanly uh, appalling than others, and ethnic cleansing, people still live, you know, and extermination, they don't. And I'm not going to be indifferent to that distinction. Um, so there are limits on Israel, and in this case, the primary limit is the United States, obviously, uh, what the U.S. says, what the U.S. says goes, says uh, George Bush Sr. famously said in 1990 to um, uh, Saddam Hussein, quote, what we say goes. 
And in the same case here, what we say goes. The United States is now under enormous pressure to stop the genocide, international pressure, and not trivially, domestic pressure. If you look at the recent, the most recent results of the Time magazine poll, 70% of young people, ages, I think, 18 to 34, because, yeah, 18 to 34, 70% oppose what Israel is doing. That's a very large number. And then among Democrats, Democrats, 70% oppose. And this is an election year. So these are serious constraints. My own guess is a turning point came with the Al-Shifa uh, public relations debacle. And at that point, you couldn't trust the word, not that I ever did trust, but the public in general understood you couldn't trust the word Israel said about anything. And my guess is uh, the United States is giving Israel, my guess is it's giving it two more weeks. It's going to give it till Christmas, and then there will be a Christmas truce, and the truce will tail off into something. There is a tension there, and I have to acknowledge the tension. I'm not a soothsayer. The tension is the following. Secretary of Defense Austin declared yesterday, we will not let Hamas win the war. Syed Nasrallah, in his last speech, the head of Hezbollah, said, we will not let Hamas lose the war. And as you can understand, that's, those are irreconcilable. The, uh, the one question that remains open is, how will Israel and the U.S. define winning the war? Up until now, the definition has been destroying Hezbollah. But now the definition has been scaled down a bit. It's killing the three main leaders. You mean, Ham you mean Hamas, uh, not Hezbollah, destroying Hamas? Hamas. Excuse, me. excuse me. Killing the three main leaders of Hamas. If they manage to do that, then they can declare victory. Uh, so even within this kind of Manichaean, we won't let them win, we won't let them war, there's a lose. There's still a kind of gray area as to how you define victory and defeat. But my guess is, I'm old enough to remember uh, the Christmas uh, ceasefires in Vietnam. Uh, so I, I, I kind of think that... You think they're building up to one. that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to ask you about Hamas, and I don't want to sort of rerun the, the debate about condemnation. We we sort of reviewed your interview with Piers Morgan in some depth, so our, our audience would have would have pretty much seen your your answer on that, which I think is very thoughtful. Um, I, I want to ask more in, in, in terms of sort of factual terms. What is their strategy? Who are they? What is the nature of Hamas? And I, I want to know from you, someone who has you know, followed the situation in Gaza for a very long period of time, to what extent has your understanding of Hamas changed since October the 7th? So not your, your, your moral assessment, but your understanding of their capability, their strategy. What is it they, they want? What is it that they are capable of doing? Have you had any sort of epiphanies since then as to, or surprises since then as to the nature of Hamas? I used to be a Maoist. And one of the statements by Chairman Mao, as we called him back then, that stuck with me, it was from his report on the peasant uprising in Hunan province. At one point he says, quote, no investigation, no right to speak. And translation, if you don't know what the F you're talking about, then shut the F up. That's, I'll put it more elegantly, or at least the English translation. I can't claim to be an expert on Hamas. I never was much interested in it. Uh, as the first sentence uh, of my book on Gaza reads, this book is not about Gaza, it's about what's been done to Gaza. Uh, because I never believed that the Palestinians in that situation had much agency. Uh, you can disagree on that, but that's my, uh, that was my judgment. Uh, what changed after October 7th? I have to say it's a kind of 
de- in some way, it's a depressing realization. Uh, the depressing realization is Hamas revealed a military capacity which, which n- definitely su- shocked me, surprised me to no end, and obviously shocked the Israelis. Now, I know a lot of people are not going to like what I'm about to say now, uh, but I will go ahead and say it. Um, Just a little bit of history, tiny bit of history. The original leader of Hezbollah was a guy named Massawi. Israel assassinated him, and they got Syed Nasrallah. Not a wise move by Israel. Israel is an extremely smart guy. He's an intense guy. He's an incorruptible guy. He is a kind of uh, Muslim Lenin. Uh, Bertrand Russell once described um, Lenin as a kind of thinking machine. He said Lenin was the most selfless person he had ever met in his life. He just had only one thing on his mind, the revolution. Brutal, of course, Russell loathed Lenin the same way that Professor Chomsky loathed Lenin, uh, but never for a moment doubted his, so to speak, purity, determination, and also sheer brilliance. It's the same thing with Nasrallah. And Nasrallah has reached the conviction, which in my opinion is unshakable, based on his historical experience, that it is impossible to coexist with Israel. It must be effaced from the map. Now, To bring us to your question, the current leaders of of, uh, Hamas have been educated by a significant life experience. Mr. Sinwar spent 10 years in a Israeli prison and has experienced the horror of Gaza concentration camp and the unspeakable, ineffable brutality of the Israeli government and citizens. The most recent polls show that about 60% of Israelis believe Israel is not using enough force in Gaza at the moment. And because of the spectacular event of October 7th, the people of Gaza aligned with the Hezbollah have now come to the conclusion that not only can they not live with Israel, but they have the military capacity. Of course, it will be a long struggle and it needs to be developed, but they have the military capacity to achieve their goal of ridding their neighborhood of that satanic state. I am not happy to say that. And now that I have, or this week I'll achieve the venerable age of 70, parts of me wish I could go to speak with Mr. Nasrallah and talk this question out, although I am quite convinced that he will not be persuaded by me. In his last speech, 
uh, Nasrallah referred to his famous statement after the Battle of Bin Jabil in the 2006 war. He referred to Israel as, quote, a spider's web. Namely, you can just blow on it and it will disintegrate. And then he said, in the real rare moment, rare moment of self-congratulation, he said, many people are thinking the same thing now about Israel, a spider's web. The spider's web was the, so to speak, Arab translation of what Mao Zedong famously would say about the United States during the war in Vietnam, that the U.S. is a paper tiger. As Mao said, it can take big bites, but it can still be defeated. And I believe that now the Hamas and Hezbollah and probably Iran are convinced that they can inflict an irreparable defeat on Israel. Now, you might say to me, well, then you're agreeing with Israel. This is an existential war. They have to defeat Hamas. I would say there's a real, speaking honestly, I'm not, I'm not a bearer of, uh, I'm not going to be a bearer of good news. I think there is a real problem now. There's a real problem now. So that, to me, is the big change since October 7th. I wish I didn't have to conclude that, but I think that is the conclusion one doesn't have to reach. It's not inexorable, but certainly it's plausible that a turning point occurred on October 7th in terms of trying to find a mutual accommodation. And eventually, you remember uh, the great historian from your neck of the woods, Eric Hobsbawm, he once commented that he went to a country and he saw that the French and the Germans were sharing the same friendship house in whichever country it was. And he said, he just, it was, as a historian, it was breathtaking. Here are these two countries, which for most of the history of the era that he chronicled and studied, were out to destroy them, destroy each other. We're now sharing the same friendship house. And one wishes that that possibility could at some point in the future, which I won't live to see, uh, come to pass between Israel and its neighbors. But when I see the determination of Nasrallah, sometimes, you know, you everybody, uh, everybody psychoanalyzes. When you look at Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich, there's no question that a turning point in his life, which put him in the revolutionary route, was the death of his, the, the killing of, the execution of his brother, who was the revered member of the Ulyanov family. And I mentioned that because it's a very personal detail, and we think of Lenin as being a kind of, as Russell said, a disembodied theory, a disembodied theory, totally selfless, disembodied theory. But no, there was a personal side. It was the fact that his brother was executed, and his brother was the pride and joy of the family. In the same way um, uh, Hezbollah's, uh, I should say Nasrallah's eldest son was killed by the Israelis. A lot of people, when October the 7th happened, you know, said, oh, this shows Israel to be a paper tiger. And I think in, in many ways, we had assumed that Israel with this incredibly high tech military force, you know, we assumed much better surveillance and intelligence than they had. That was sort of blown to pieces, that sort of illusion of invincibility was blown to pieces on October the 7th. But I think you can also make an argument that, you know, the axis of resistance, so Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, has been shown to be somewhat of a paper tiger. And to uh, to put that argument forward, I would say this, it seems to me that the one, you know, 
explanation for Hamas's action where it makes sort of strategic, tactical, rational sense is they assume that by provoking the kind of response they have from Israel, um, Hezbollah would have no chance, no choice, sorry, but to get involved. Iran would have to get involved. You would spark some kind of uprising on the West Bank. You'd potentially spark some uprising among um, Palestinian citizens of Israel. And Hamas have, you know, done this extraordinarily provocative act. Israel has responded in the way that I assume Hamas sort of predicted with sort of an incredibly bloody, almost genocidal war. But there has been relative quiet from all of those people who they hoped would rise up in solidarity with them. And to me, that seems, you know, to be potentially a signal that, you know, Lebanon is already in an economic crisis. They don't want to enter into a war with Israel. Iran is, you know, struggling economically. They don't want to enter into a war with, with Israel. I'm not really sure what's going on in the West Bank. I suppose you could say, you know, it's impossible to have an uprising because Israeli um, forces are so overbearing. But then, you know, you could have made the same argument about Hamas making an incursion into Israel. It seems to me in a way that sort of the people who were supposed to rise up and, and give the backing to Hamas that they were sort of calling for from their allies have failed to turn up. I don't know. What do you, what do you make of that? I think the problem is you uh, and many others are making suppositions without any factual basis. We don't know what Hamas intended to accomplish or to achieve on that date. We don't, as far as is everybody in the intelligence community seems to concur, and as Nasrallah said, they were not informed in advance of this action that Hamas was going to take. So I would draw a distinction. First of all, I don't think we can make any, we can't pass any judgments on the success of their operation if we don't know what the purpose of the operation was. I think that remains a question mark. Uh, what exactly Hamas hoped to spark, I think is a giant question mark because I'm sure that Hezbollah and Iran weren't pleased by the fact that Hamas executed this colossal operation without even bothering to inform them in advance. So I can't speculate on exactly what Hamas intended to achieve. I have my own theory, which for better, which you can or can't accept, namely, there were, there was information that came out immediately after October 7th, indicating that Egypt had gotten wind of this operation and was going to pass on intelligence information, that intelligence information to Israel. And so Hamas had panicked that it's two or so years of preparation we're now going to go to naught. So it very abruptly carried out this operation without the kinds of planning and communication, say with Hezbollah and Iran that normally would have attended or preceded the operation. But that's pure speculation for various reasons. For example, they weren't even aware that there was going to be that music festival, which shows at the last minute, very poor intelligence. At the last minute, very poor intelligence. And that might be because they decided in the spur of the moment to, so to speak, climax those two or so years of preparation. In any event, one has to make a distinction between political and military uh, capacity. Uh, Zhu Dei was the leader of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. He was a very good military technician, but the overall strategic uh, vision came from Mao Zedong in the same way during uh, the war in Vietnam, uh, Giap 
was the military tactician at the Bien Phu. The uh, strategic vision came from Ho Chi Minh and so forth. So even as uh, Hamas demonstrated a military capacity on October 7th, does it necessarily denote that it has a strategic vision or a realistic strategic vision? That, I think, is a separate question. What I want to do now is put to you sort of a few arguments that people make in defense of Israel's actions and how they are, you know, carrying out this war um, on Gaza. And um, because I know you sort of studied them in, in, in detail over the past you know, 15 years or 20 years or so. Um, and I want to get your, your thoughts on how sort of your analyses update to the present. So the first is human shields. Um, so, you know, in, in previous wars, you've talked about how the ratio of, of deaths on the Palestinian side to deaths on the Israeli side is, is so wildly um, out of proportion. And then what the Israelis say is they say, well, this is not because we are, you know, especially brutal. It's because Hamas use Palestinian civilians as human shields. So what are we supposed to do? We're put in an impossible bind. Either we let them win or we kill a lot of civilians. Obviously, this has been um, in the news um, with claims and counterclaims about hospitals. How do you respond to, to that argument? The current situation is as follows. Number one, there have been numerous statements coming out from the Israeli government. I will change it from numerous, numerous to numberless statements. It's actually a kind of encyclopedia at this point of statements by the Israeli government making the point that we're not distinguishing between Hamas and the civilian population, that for various reasons they voted for Hamas, they didn't revolt against Hamas, they've chaired Hamas, they're related to Hamas, the, and so on and so forth. You know the picture. Uh, there is no distinction. So that being said, the human shields issue is totally irrelevant because Israel is saying everybody is Hamas. So who is the shield? If, uh, who is the shield and who is hiding behind the shield if everybody is Hamas? Uh, number two, if you look at the numbers of deaths that have occurred, the deaths uh, is about 70% uh, women and children. Children account for about 43% of the deaths. They account for about 50% of the population. If you look at the distribution of deaths, the proportional distribution of deaths between men, women, and children, and the proportional distribution of population, men, women, and children in Gaza, it's almost, it's very close. Uh, that means if you bomb an area and you are not targeting women and children, you're going to get the same number of deaths as if you bomb an area and you are targeting women and children. Since the proportion is almost the same as the population, it's slightly higher proportion of men, but that's for the obvious reason that when there is a need for, let's say, a desperate need for water, a desperate need for food, a desperate need for medical uh, assistance. It's the man who's going to go out in the battlefield uh, to search for A, B, or C. So he or she is going to become more vulnerable to uh, death, uh, to killing. Aside from that slight discrepancy in the number of men killed, uh, it's clear that this is just a completely indiscriminate bombing. Uh, that's going on in Gaza. Otherwise, there would be, as in every other conflict, there would be a notable dis difference, differentiation between the number of women and children killed uh, and the number of men killed. Uh, so if you look simply at the statistics, the raw data, and the um, statements by the Israeli government, it seems to me that the whole issue of uh, human shielding is a red herring uh, as to whether Hamas has in the past engaged in human shielding. 
I would say the, uh, not I would say, based on reading the human rights reports, uh, the answer is next, next to near zero evidence. Uh, what there is evidence for, and we don't want to get too much into technicalities, uh, human shielding generally means this conscripting of civilians um, in order to either protect a combatant or protect a military uh, site. And the evidence there of Hamas carrying, uh, uh, engaging in human shielding is very slight. On the other hand, there's a second kind of violation of the laws of war. Um, the laws of war require that a, a, uh, a, military a military force has to take all, the expression is, all feasible measures uh, in order not to endanger the civilian population. So if you have, you're engaging in, say, urban fighting, and you have the option of, uh, of, re of uh, fighting further away or closer to a civilian population, uh, then you have to take all feasible precautions, which is to say to be further away, if you have the option between further away and closer, to be further away, all feasible precautions. And Hamas has been charged with not taking all feasible precautions. Of course, the question arises, how do you determine that on the battlefield? Very gray area. And number two, uh, how many options do you have in among the most densely populated civilian areas in the world? Uh, but if you look at the laws of war, and I teach what's called International Humanitarian Law, IHL, the laws of war, you'll see that most of it is just complete nonsense, has nothing to do with the real world. Uh, these are kinds of issues that uh, experts ponder. So, for example, in your Guardian newspaper, there was an article about whether it was proportionate to drop two 2,000 pound bombs on Jabalia refugee camp. And so what does proportionate mean? Proportionate, proportionality in the IHL, the laws of war, proportionality means that if you target a legitimate military site, the value of that military site has to be greater than the amount of co uh, collateral damage. So let's put that in simple language. Let's say you're targeting, as is the case in Jabalia, they claimed, I don't believe a word Israel says, not one word, but they claimed they were targeting a senior Hamas official or terrorist, forget official, terrorist. They say they're targeting a senior Hamas terrorist. And then according to the laws of war, how many civilians is it permissible to kill such that it is proportionate to the value of taking out this target namely a senior Hamas terrorist. Now, I'm sure, Michael, you are smart enough to figure out that's an impossible calculation. And if you read the Guardian article in Jabalia, the expert, she says, this is a very complicated question of proportionality because he was, a, he was allegedly a senior Hamas terrorist, so is killing 126 civilians in Gaza proportional to the value of the target? It's so stupid. You know, one day, if humanity survives, which is a very big question mark, if humanity survives, they're going to be looking 
back at this kind of insanity. And this is supposedly people who are committed to the rule of law, the most civilized of people engage in these kinds of uh, debased uh, calculations. Totally sick. What exactly do you think about that statement? I mean, I, I, I think that's a pretty shocking statement for, for many reasons, but I want to sort of hone in on exactly why you do. Because, you know, the idea of saying it is proportionate to kill some civilians to get a high-level target. Now, you know, to use the example everyone hates, if you were to kill 126 civilians who were standing next to Hitler, maybe you would do it, right? So it, it, is the argument that it's always wrong to kill civilians to try and hit a military target? Or is the argument that, you know, these Hamas people are nowhere near high enough military targets to justify killing that many innocent people in a refugee camp? I mean, how, how are you passing out the logic you're, you're putting forward here? It's not an argument. You can't calculate that. So stop pretending as if you can. It's not possible to calculate those kinds of things. I've gone over this in my class, my classes a thousand times. If there's a terrorist sitting in the classroom, is it okay to kill all 60 of you? <laughs> my students aren't particularly enamored of that comparison. So of course they say no. How can you find out know, what is the point, excuse me, what is the point of these learned disquisitions on a question that can't, you know, it's like how many angels can you uh, balance on the uh, head of a needle? It, there, there's no sense to this. So we should just admit it. We should acknowledge it. The main demand actually from progressives at the moment, I mean, as well as sort of more long term issues of justice for Palestine, is to call for a ceasefire. Um, and the argument that tends to be put forward um, in opposition to a, well, there's many arguments that tend to be put forward in, in 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 opposition to a ceasefire. But one of them is that there's no point in making a ceasefire with Hamas because they'll just break it. People say there was a ceasefire um, in place on October the sixth, and then they broke it on October the seventh. It's obviously also contentious exactly how um, the truce, which was in place until Friday, so that seven day truce, broke down. So how do you respond to people who say you can't? You, you can't agree a ceasefire with Hamas because they'll just break it. Well, at some level, that's actually true. Because what does a ceasefire mean? You leave the status quo in place, which means you leave the concentration camp in place. Is there any possibility? And is it a realistic expecta expectation? Is it even a desirable expectation? that that situation in Gaza should uh, proceed in perpetuity. So as a logical matter, of course it's true the ceasefire is going to be, is going to break down at some point. The ceasefire has to be followed by uh, a settlement of the conflict. So, there are many instances, actually the overwhelming majority of instances, when Israel has broken the ceasefire, at least in terms of the available information. I go through all the data in my book on Gaza. Uh, it's clear in 2006, Israel broke the ceasefire that then proceeded on to Operation Cast Lead. Uh, uh, the ceasefire went into effect in June 2000. Uh, eight, uh, broke down on November 4th, 2008. Uh, it was election day in the United States, so Israel saw an opportunity to break the ceasefire because it knew all the attention was going to be focused on Barack Obama, the first black president. And on November 4th, it uh, killed several Palestinian militants in Gaza, broke the ceasefire. There's no question about that. That's not a matter of debate. Uh, and then it uh, eventually... Uh, escalate into what became Operation Cast Lead. Um, but on the other hand, if you take 2021, and I have to be careful here, because as I've said on many occasions, in 2020, I stopped following the Israel-Palestine conflict, but I have it on the word of you know, knowledge of people like Moeen Rabani, that uh, is, uh, Hamas did take the initiative in 2021 
um, because of the, if you remember, in the uh, encroachments in Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem, and then the encroachments on the um, most, one of the three most holy sites in Islam, Hamas did break the ceasefire. And my answer is, well, yes. And do you really think that Hamas will acquiesce, uh, first of all, to its own acquiesce in perpetuity to its incarceration of a 2.3 million uh, civilian population, half of whom are children, they're going to acquiesce in perpetuity to that situation, or they're going to acquiesce in Israel's deprivations uh, and criminal provocations in the West Bank and East Jerusalem? Uh, no, the answer is no. I'm not going to deny that. There's not going to be a permanent ceasefire. If the permanent ceasefire leaves the status quo ante in place, it's not going to happen. 